for those of you who were here on Tuesday. In particular, I, I want to thank you for coming back. <laughs> um, for those who weren't, um, welcome. Uh, I am going to really talk more about the work that's happened within the Tom Alton community um, over the last 20 years. Some of what we are have learned and are in the process of learning and some of maybe the implications for, for all of us in that work. But as Michelle said, I do think it's important to start with the, the, the images and the voices and the sense of place, which I'll be talking about. So just start with some photos and, and voices first. <laughs> song. Um, that's the, uh, that's Danny Lopez, but the, the late Danny Lopez, who was an elder, who I'm going to be talking with a lot. But the beginning of that song starts with Itoi, elder brother. The, the, the autumn creator says, Itoi looks out over the desert and is happy to see the <coughs> It's very, very simple, but that, that joy, that happiness, that, that, uh, Itoi feels at seeing his people in the desert. Um, the Tano Autum are a desert people. Um, Tano Autum translates as, as desert people. It is, it is who um, the Autum people are. And um, I'm going to start with a little story about kind of one of my first really seminal moments being in the community almost 20 years ago. Um, my wife had actually taken a job on the reservation and we moved there and um, I started working on the garden. Um, I was very interested on my own in the traditional plants and um, food varieties of, of the Tonawatan people and um, oops, that's not quite, ah, sorry I messed things up. Um, and the garden was quite a, a chore. Um, it was a very rocky rocky soil in which we were working. Um, it was not in one of the traditional farming areas that I will talk about. So it was weeks and months of pulling stones out and, and planting the, the um, traditional varieties, learning about them, finding those seeds. And um, I was mostly alone for it. But slowly, kids began to come. You know, kids are always the, the curious ones, the, the ones who are, are always willing to, to have those conversations. And they start asking, what are you doing? You know, that was always the thing, what are you doing? Right? And, and so I started to engage them and work with them. And slowly, this kind of core group of kids began to show up every day after school. We'd be out in this garden. And we were growing traditional ton autumn crops, but also carrots and onions and you know, other things. And it was really this wonderful place for young people to come together and begin to reconnect in a very real way to the land. And this had been going on for a few months, and in, it was usually in the evenings that we were meeting after school. And um, I started to notice across the road, there was a hill, and cars kept kind of going up that hill and, and stopping for a few minutes and, and then leaving, or someone might get out for a little while and walk around and then leave. And I didn't think much of it. And then one day, this young girl, she's probably eight years old at the time, Sissy Marie Wan. Sissy said to me, so have you seen her? And I said, yeah, seen who? She goes, the Virgin, the Virgin Mary, she's in that tree up there. And I looked up and I saw a tree. And I said, she is? She goes, yeah, come here, come here. And she, she physically moved me and, and, and placed me and said, so you have to stand here and then kind of tilt your, tilt your head a little bit and you know, maybe squint a little bit. And, and there she is, do you see her? And I think I said yes, but I, I didn't 
I didn't see her. <laughs> um, and a couple of evenings later, um, I was walking Sissy home. And this is a, a troubled community because there had just recently been a large gang confrontation. And seven um, young men had been stabbed and air evacuated to a hospital. And um, so we decided we should pre probably be walking the, the, the kids home at night. And so that, a few nights later, I, I walked Sissy home, and um, I walked her home a number of times, and this time her mother came out. And um, Kathy, her mother, stopped me, and I never really had, I mean, I met her, but I never had a conversation with her. And, and Kathy stopped me and, and said, so did, 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 do you know what's going on across the road? And I said, do you mean the, the virgin and, and the tree? And she said, yeah. And I said, yeah, you know, the kids have told me, told me what's going on. And she said, well, you know, I think she's there because she likes to see what's happening in the garden. She likes to see what's going on with the kids. And that's why the Virgin is there on that hill looking down on the garden. And I think that's when I saw the miracle. Yeah, that was the moment. It wasn't looking at that tree, but it was in in that conversation and in those relationships. And, you know, I really took a lot away from that. And there's, there's so much to unpack in that. First of all, how we see is where we stand. And sometimes we need to be guided to those places of, of where we stand and, and how we look at things. We have to be told, you know, well, tilt your head and look at it this way. And, maybe squint a little bit and do all of those things that, that's going to determine whether or not you see. And so where we stand and, and how we're guided to those points by people is critical to how, how we see the world, not just how we see these, these images. Um, I also had to kind of think about you know, how, how we rely on others to help us learn and help us understand the world but also the ambiguity of it all. And that it, it happens in, in relationship. If I hadn't been having this interaction with these kids every night, I never would have seen, I may have noticed the cars coming and going, but I never would have known what was happening there. And so without relationship, without just being in place with people, you don't see those things. And then to embrace ambiguity and trust, um, I didn't see it but I had to believe that others did see it. And that sometimes even our own preconceptions and, and inability to see doesn't mean it's not there. And, and finally, there was this real community of people who were creating this meaning. It didn't matter if only one person saw this. It was in the sharing of it and the, the engaging with it. So for me, 19, 18, 19 years ago, having, having that experience and then walking home and maybe I didn't see the Virgin, but I saw the miracle that was happening there. That kind of guided my own personal journey within the community um, for many years to come and, and some of those lessons. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the work we've done, but I also think it's important to hear these perspectives and these stories and to be guided and to be shown where to stand and how to stand there, and maybe to trust that even when we can't see things, others will. So um, before I talk anymore, I'm going to share the voice of an elder from the community um, about some of the work that's been going on. Se kar mat kso, se kar mat kso, se kapan pa o nyai chimat piha ichu pe. Se kar mat kso. Round and round, you go into my basket. And pretty soon, I'm gonna have my basket full of children. Then the coyote will come after me and he will not get nothing because I would have already gotten all the chiori. What it means that uh, you are supposed to get up early in the morning 
And you're supposed to go out there before anybody else. Maybe you're the coyote. Maybe you don't get up till 10 o'clock and then you come after me and I'm already done picking the chori. I hope that um that you're with me on this uh, picking your your children or whatever there is out there for us to eat and um because uh, I said earlier in there that um there's a saying that they say that Ethos is gonna get mad at you or get upset at you because he made it for us and uh, look at how we are now today we we're not healthy because we have let those things go that is our own food. We didn't teach our children, we didn't teach our grandchildren, our uh, great-grandchildren now. And I hope that you are teaching your children to start back on this uh, path of our lives as autumn people, as our himda, that they will learn to uh, eat these things and make their taste buds uh, accept them. and. And so they can be healthy and don't have to have uh, diabetes and other things that we do uh, when we um, left our foods. And so um, the little blessing uh, is supposed to encourage us to, uh, to um, go out and uh, do this and uh, be an example for, for everybody. Uh, not only our own people, but other people. And we can share with them the things that are good for our lives. Christine Johnson Bupp, who um, also is another elder who passed away in the last few years. Um, but that willingness to share and that willingness to build knowledge and to reclaim knowledge and reclaim what I talked about the other day, which is not knowledge as a body of work, as a noun, but knowledge as a, as a way of life and a way of being in the world. And so really for the last 20 years, um, that's the work that we've been doing within the Tonawatham community. So I'm going to step back from the storytelling a little bit and, and just try and provide some, some context. Um, the Tonawatham community is, there's a, a reservation that is huge. It's more than 11 million square kilometers. So it's actually larger than I think uh, 11 US states. So it's a very large area. And there are about 28,000 members of the tribe who are spread across this area in about 70 villages. So it's, you're dealing with a lot of very small um, communities um, that are very, very traditional. Um, one thing to note is how young the community is. And this is true in many indigenous communities now. More than half of the community is under 25. And so engaging young people has really been a focus of our, our work for, for many, many years. Um, the traditional Tonawatham food system really had three big components. Um, the first was a, a form of dry land farming called Akchin farming, and I'm gonna talk a little bit in detail about what that was and what it looked like and what's happened with that. Um, the second was the harvesting of wild plants and wild foods. And for many people who aren't familiar with deserts, you'd think there's nothing there. But as you saw Christine picking the choya buds, the buds from the choya cactus, those foods are there. And often, his, uh, if you go back far enough in history, made up actually a majority of the food eaten by people. And then the third was hunting, um, whether it be small pack rats and grubs up to large deer and uh, bighorn sheep. So these were really the three components of the traditional um, food system. As late as the 1930s, the community was almost 100% food self-sufficient. There were a few exceptions. You know, Danny would talk about coffee and sugar, right? But really not, not, not the core of the diet. Really until the Second World War, the community was almost 100% self-sufficient, farming on just 20 to 25 uh, centimeters of rain a year. Um, but that rain all comes, or most of it comes, in a very short period, and that's what makes farming possible. To give you a sense of what happened to the, the loss of the food system, um, uh, just, just using the traditional Akchin floodwater farming, um, in, the, in 1930 there was an estimate that there were over 700,000 kilos of tepary beans, which I'll talk about, one of the, the, the staple foods 
uh, being produced by the community. Um, in the year 2000, we couldn't get 75 kilos. Um, that in 1936, there were about 20,000 acres under cultivation. And again, by 2000, that was under two acres. It was one elder in one community who was growing traditional crops in these ways. So you really saw this, this loss and this change within um, the, the food system. You probably can't quite see it, but this is an aerial photograph from 1936 of one village. Um, and it's a village called Cowlick, and we're going to be talking about it. But it shows these contiguous fields. I think they're about 1,100 acres under cultivation then. Um, by 2001, no, none of the fields were being cultivated. So there's really been this loss of the, the traditional food system. Um, let me explain a little bit about how this worked. Akchin farming um, in the desert relies on the fact that all of the fields are in the floodplain. So what happens is in the summer monsoons, when it's quite hot, we get you know, 43, 44, 45 degrees during the day, and in the evenings, these huge thunderstorms will come. And they will dump water, um, and all of that water goes into washes and leads to this sheet flooding, um, where the washes or the arroyos open out. And so you're basically concentrating and collecting water from a really vast area. It's going into these runoff washes, coming down into the fields and into the alluvial floodplain, where you're getting not only the concentration of, of rainwater, but also of organic matter into the fields. This was really important because that's what really made farming and agriculture possible in the desert. So you can just see this isn't even planted at this point. This is just the, the growth and the green that, that's popping up in the desert in those areas. Um, what was grown uh, primarily was the three sisters that pe the people refer to, um, tepary beans. Tepary beans are the most heat tolerant and drought tolerant um, legume in the world. Uh, you can get a crop on one watering. Better is two, and more than that, actually you see yields begin to decline because the plant will put um, its energies into vine growth rather than reproduction uh, in the form of the beans and the seeds. Um, there are two main varieties, but there are actually hundreds of varieties within the community. The um, Papa Goat name that Michelle mentioned means um, bean eaters in actually the Basque language. Um, original Spanish settlers had a lot of uh, Basques with them, and they recognized how essential the tepary bean was to the people. The Milky Way is white tepary beans that coyote bun scattered across the sky. So. The tepary bean really was, was the staple. There's also um, corn. Uh, autumn corn, it's a 60-day corn, which means from germination to harvest, 60 days. Um, most corn in the world is 120, maybe, days. Um, and it's because there's this very short monsoon period during which agriculture has to take place. And um, so these varieties have, have been adapted um, to the environment. Um, of course, squash is the third of the three sisters. Um, this is the, the halmanath, the baby squash. Um, it's much like a, a courgette or a summer you know, zucchini or something, but it grows into these extremely large winter squash. So not only can it be eaten small and fresh, but then it also can be dried. This is one squash that's been cut in a spiral, hung out to dry, and then bundled for storage throughout the year. So in terms of the cultivated crops, those were the, the three main ones. But there were also um, melons. This is a, a, a tunnel from watermelon, which is bright yellow instead of bright red. Um, incredible flavors, because with very little water, um, the flavors become concentrated, much as a, the tomato flavor gets concentrated when you dry it and becomes some dried tomato. Um, so you know, these were some of the, the, the crops that were grown. What were the, the impacts, though, of this loss of, of the traditional food system? Well, the first is health. Um, in 1960, no member of the Tonawatan tribe had ever had type 2 diabetes. Today, more than 60% of adults have it. And kids, you know, it used to be called adult onset diabetes, but five and six-year-old kids are getting it. These are the highest rates in the world. 
Um, and that's largely been because of the change of diet. Um, very quickly, the, basically what happened, all of those foods I just mentioned, the cultivated foods as well as the wild foods that you saw Christine picking, in order to survive in the harsh desert um, environment, they develop certain compounds that absorb water very quickly and release it very slowly. Well, it turns out, when you eat those same compounds, they s slow the absorption of sugar into the bloodstream. So over generations, what happened is the altum pancreas became suppressed. It didn't need to control blood sugar levels because the foods themselves were doing it. But as soon as you moved from those foods, you began to see the obesity epidemic, the diabetes, the diabetes epidemic, all of these nutrition-related things happen. So this has been in a really short period of time. And much of the research that's been done in the States, there's been $100 million spent on researching diabetes in the Altham communities, but it's all been genetic. But what changed in the 50 years, 60 years? It wasn't the genes, it was the foods. It was the food systems. It was the, the social and um, material structures of the community. So that's been one of the impacts. Uh, a second impact is economic. When you really think of an economy, it's about providing for the material needs of a people. Right? So whether it was measured in dollars or measured in, in beans, um, the traditional economy has really been in decline to the point now where you have um, more than three quarters of the um, working population unemployed, um, very high levels of poverty. Um, so there's the loss of that material economic um, system that was built in the food system really has been, uh, had devastating effects. And then the third area is really the, the loss of culture. Taunatum culture is an agriculture. Almost every song, legend, ceremony, um, story, social gathering is really based in, in the relationship with food and the land. And so as you saw this decline in the, the agricultural and food systems, you saw a real decline in the cultural practices that related to them. Um, one example is the Jujkita. And the Jujkita is the rain ceremony. And it's not just a ceremony, it's weeks and weeks of preparation. You go out first in the summer, in, at the end of June, beginning of July, and you may have seen some of those pictures of people with sticks harvesting on the giant saguaro cactus that are 10 or 12 meters high. Um, well, you do this in June when it's you know, 45 degrees out, and you camp out, and you, you harvest the saguaro fruit, and you do all of that, and that then becomes... Um, a, a drink that is fermented and used in the ceremony. And the ceremony itself is four nights from um, dusk till dawn of singing and song cycles and um, of dancing. And there are these song cycles and then there's speeches and there are eventually the um, consuming and the drinking of the saguaro fruit wine. And it's not very alcoholic, but it is very, very sweet. And people often get sick. So that then there's the vomiting up of the clouds. The, the, you know, it's this cleansing and this ritual cleansing that happens that brings the rains. Well, what happened when people stopped planting their fields? Well, if the rains come, it's nice, but it's not really quite as critical. Right? So people slowly stopped doing the ceremony. Um, often you hear in, in a lot of native communities in, in North America, you hear about the need for cultural revitalization. And what that means is we're going to bring back a ceremony, or we're going to bring back a song, or we're going to bring back a story. But unless it's reconnected with the material practices of life out of which it emerged, it's, it becomes meaningless to a certain degree. Um, it becomes a process of um, maintaining the, um, the forms without its meaning. And I'm going to take a quick second for another real quick story. Um, when I first met Danny Lopez, who you heard singing at the beginning, he was teaching in one of the primary schools on the reservation. And he was the language and culture teacher. And I'd been invited to go over, and he had a, a traditional singing and dance group there at the school. And we were in the, the school cafeteria, and the singers, the, the kids, uh, performed. I would call it performed. 
for the student body um, with the, some traditional songs and, and some traditional dancing. And it was fine. It was nice. It was very, you know, meaningful at, at a certain level. But I then invited Danny to bring his class and his group to the garden. And we got to the garden, and these are maybe 10-year-old, 11-year-old, 12-year-old kids who are part of the group. And Danny, Danny always, it was good, he always had his rattle stuck in the back of it, his yeah, pants under his belt. And he started to talk, and he said, when I was a kid, my grandfather would take us to the fields, and he'd bring out the seeds, and Danny reached in his pocket and pulled out a handful of the seeds. And he said, and he would sing to them. So he reached back and he got his rattle and he started that soft rattling and, and he sang a blessing song for the seeds. And you could hear a pin drop because once again, there was this reconnection between the cultural practices and they were being placed back in context where they belonged and where they had their deepest meaning. And so for much of the next 20 years, it was really this process of, of reconnecting health, economics, culture, meaning, empowerment, collective meaning making, um, all of these things in ways that, that were putting them back into their, their full social, ecological, um, economic um, context. So that's a lot of the, the, the work that um, happened. So back in 1995, um, a group of people got together and started uh, TOCA, Tonaltham Community Action, and I was um, fortunate enough to be a part of that group. And, and TOCA really, from a very early period, adopted four principles. Um, and the first is about the Altham Himdag. Now, there is no word in English that I know for Himdag. It's been translated as lifeways, but um, I don't have time to show the video, but there's a really great video of that same Sissy Marie Wan, that little eight-year-old girl who tried to show me the Virgin. I've heard many years later talking about it. She says, it's the clouds. Himdog is the clouds. But it's our songs. It's our foods. It's our kinship relationships. It's, it's really the, the, what it means to be author. And we took this concept of the Himdog, and that is wisdom from the past that creates solutions for the future. So it really is looking backward in order to move forward. Um, what are the solutions, what are the things that guide um, community solutions and community meaning making and community action moving forward? So that was one of the, the principles. A, a second one was to really create an empowerment model versus a service model. And broadly, there are a lot of social programs on the Taunton Nation addressing a lot of the issues I, I pointed to. But they're all programs that um, provide services. They do stuff for people rather than with people. And that goes for social service um, things. It goes <laughs> often for research issues. It, you know, we're going to research genetics rather than engage people in coming up and researching and understanding solutions. So we really said it's important to empower individuals and the community as a whole um, rather than to do stuff for the community. Third area was really to look at asset-based organizing. Not focus on unemployment, loss of health, loss of, but what is in the community that can be built upon? The Tawn Autumn are still in their homeland. There still are those millions of acres of land and those 20,000 acres of uncultivated farmland that's there. You have 75% unemployment. That means there are a lot of people with a lot of time on their hands who are looking for meaningful labor, paid or unpaid. You know, so to really, you know, the, the wisdom of elders, the energy and enthusiasm and creativity of youth, we really said as, a, as an organization, we need to value those things and focus on those. And finally, to look at, at two things. So often organizations um, either focus on the empowerment of individuals and families or on the changing of the systems in which they live. But ultimately, you have to do both. Um, so, for example, nutrition programs. You can tell people to eat traditional foods because they're healthy and will help prevent diabetes, but if the kids are eating two meals a day at school 
and they're getting just crap lunches and crap breakfasts. There's no individual choice. There's no individual empowerment. So that's a system that needs to be changed. If no one's growing those traditional foods, you know, we had one elder say, they tell us we have to eat better, but we can't eat what we can't get. Right? So you know, it was really this combining of individual empowerment um, and collective empowerment with systems change. Um, I'm not going to go into all of what we've done over 20 years. Um, we've had wild food harvesting cooperatives. We have both a, uh, and have both a traditional and um, a larger production farm to bring back the production of the, tra uh, the traditional crops. Um, we've had an incredibly successful beginner, beginning farmer training program that's training a new generation of community members in both traditional and, and kind of modern sustainable techniques of farming. We've established school gardens, uh, a cafe that's actually serving traditional foods and creating outlets both for uh, farmers and other producers um, as well as making them available. If you're a working mom who, you know, doesn't have time to spend five hours cooking tepary beans, which they can take sometimes. It's nice to be able to come in and take it home. Um, we've been working to actually uh, take over school food services, which have been being run by Sodexo, which you may know is a French multinational corporation that's even there in the isolated Tonotham Nation. And to say, what would it look like to, to bring traditional foods back into the schools and to relocalize that? Um, and then educational efforts, such as Native Food Waste Magazine, which was floating around um, uh, at, on Tuesday, and I can certainly show with people. So I'm going to real quickly try and go through just a couple of, of how we did some of the things. And I'm going to use one example. Um, we engaged in a community planning process. This was over a decade ago, um, in which we were really trying to understand and then develop a strategic plan around wellness. And, it was kind of vague. And I think that vagueness is very important and good. Because we started with, for example, this summit. It was a um, two-day summit um, in which we had 340 people participate, from 10 years old to well over 90. In a community of 20,000 people, that's a pretty significant number. And during this, um, this planning retreat, one of the things that we really did is there was no talking heads. There was none of what doing what I'm doing now. No one stood in front of the room and, and lectured. It was all active engagement, conversations, small group, large group, um, drawings, um, you know, just kind of a whole variety of engaging on a variety of issues around wellness, around things like historical trauma and how people's historic, the, the people's historic um, history continues to play itself out today. Visioning what, are, what is the river of, of wellness in the community? What contributes, what are the tributaries to wellness that, that flow into it? What are the dams? And so we had people doing um, drawing and things like that. And out of this came a common vision. And we did it very simply. At the end of the first day, we asked all 340 people, what's one thing that is important to a healthy Tonawatham community? Very simple question. We had a, you know, little file cards and everyone wrote it down. And then a group of about 20 people got together that night and to put it in research terms, coded the responses. But really what it was is we just identified the themes. What is here? What, what are people? And it was really interesting. I'm going to show you what, the, what happened because 11 <coughs> themes really emerged. And then the second day, these were presented back to the community, back to those 340 people and said, this is what we heard. Does this, does this reflect a vision of a healthy community? And people largely said, yes. And from there, we began the process of planning. How do you then make those things happen? Um, the 11 things that came up, I'm not going to read through them, but you're going to start to see them. And they go well beyond what I think a Western conception of wellness, when you're talking about health and wellness, would be. You know, you're talking about empowerment. You're talking about relationship and kinship. You're talking about ways of collaborating and working together. These were all the community's vision of wellness and health. And so this really guided, and this process really has guided, and this vision has guided the work for, for many years. Um, I'm going to move on real quick because I, I want to make sure that we have time for conversation. Um, I'm just going to give you some examples of, of 
the practical work that's come out of this. These are um, images um, from Terrell Johnson's family. Terrell is the co-founder, and it was he and I were co-directors. He's now executive director of TOCA. Um, this is from his family and his family's fields. That's his grandfather, Alex Poncho. And the work that we've done, for example, to start and bring back some of the traditional Akchin flood fields took place here. Um, I showed a little video on Tuesday of, of Terrell's grandmother out in those, those fields, Sharon. Um, there was a real process of reclamation. What does it mean to reclaim the, uh, the, the Akchin farming? And the first thing is that it always begins in the community with blessing and, and seeking the, the blessing of Itoi, seeking the blessing of the ancestors, um, of the land, of all of that. So that, that was really an important process. Um, and then there was the backbreaking process of clearing the trees. What you didn't see on that video, if you were here on Tuesday, is Terrell and Nolan, his brother, kept going, Grandma, are you sure this is where the fields were? Because there are mesquite trees everywhere. It was completely overground. She said, yeah, it was right here. It was right here. People are, are you sure, Grandma? Yeah. And finally, we went around, and there was a, a larger tree. And under it were two horse-drawn plows that had been left in the field. And so there was this process of, of clearing, um, which eventually led to this. This is before the first um, planting um, in those fields. Uh, the community then became very much engaged in, in the, the planting and the harvesting and the whole process of what became the Alexander Poncho Memorial Farm, um, where there has been for now almost a decade these beginning farmer training programs, ground blessing ceremonies, harvest feasts and harvest festivals, um, it really has become a center for reclamation, not only of food, not only of agriculture, but of culture um, within the Tonawakan community. So what are some of the big implications of all of this? Um, I think first is to go back to that concept of economics and some of the potential. One of the things is within the Tonawakan community, we have all that poverty, right? But there's between 56 and $84 million a year that's being spent on food. And well less than 5% of that is being spent in the community. So even just looking at kind of a more conventional form of economic development, of economic um, exchange, the ability to rebuild food systems could generate amazing potential for economic development that is culturally based, culturally appropriate, um, ecologically based, ecologically appropriate, and at a human scale. Um, if you apply this to the, to the U.S. as a whole, um, Native tribes spend about $4.5 billion a year on food, again, creating these potentials. Um, and if you begin to look across the Americas, we just did some kind of brief data looking at it, um, we're talking about over um, $60 billion a year that is currently economic activity that's in the hands of indigenous people, that if you shift to local food sovereignty visions of food economies can have a profound economic impact in people's lives. But also to remember that wealth and wealth generation is about way more than economic exchange. And so we've done some really interesting looking at models of, of more traditional forms of, of economies. Um, secondly is we've done a lot of work and the impacts around health. The, I mentioned the diabetes within the community, but that's not unique. Um, in, we've done exchanges in northern Alaska, in the Arctic, where as people have moved from their traditional diet, they're too seeing um, devastating health impacts. Down to the tip of Florida, you know, the, the indigenous peoples and place-based peoples in general across the globe are seeing these, these impacts. So the you know, they've seen it in, in um, Australia and you know, all over the world, this is, this is happening. And so the resilience and the ability to, to rebuild and reclaim food systems and food sovereignty in communities is also the, the ability to reclaim health and wellness within communities um, beyond the Tonawakan community. Um, I think I skipped one, but the other thing then, of course, is, um, Sorry about that. Um, and I don't think I have a slide, but also the reclamation of culture. Right? The, the rerouting of culture that I was referring to. 
um, the placing cultural expressions back in their context and connecting them to their material roots. So there's been a real uh, renaissance of autumn language, autumn songs, autumn ceremony that's gone along with the rebuilding of, of the food systems. So um, I think that that's really been extremely important. Um, sorry, I'm kind of having some issue here, issues here. But um, I think that what's happened and is we've kind of moved from looking at just um, what's going on with food to really kind of looking at the, these functions of food sovereignty that happen from this practice and this praxis with the community over 20 years. So food sovereignty in the Tonalton context operates in many ways. It's an assertion of cultural identity and a reassertion of, of himdog, um, of kinship, of culture, of identity. Uh, it's an economic development strategy and a model of indigenous economics. Um, it's a health promotion and wellness strategy. It's a pedagogical approach and, and empowerment strategy. Um, it's a way of enriching the political context of sovereignty, which tribes are asserting at a political level, to say, what does it mean to be a sovereign nation if you're 100% dependent for your food and well-being? Um, and ultimately, it's also an aspirational concept. Um, sometimes the, the goals and our values and our aspirations don't quite match up to our practice and our praxis. But to hold out an aspirational um, concept of what it means to, to move ahead as a people has been very important. Um, I'm going to end with one brief story. Uh, this is Danny Lopez, who I've been talking a lot about. And Danny, there was a real break in culture for two generations within the Alton community. And Danny was one of two or three people who very much carried forward the culture during the, what was really a very dark time of experience of both external and internal colonized behaviors and institutions and things. Um, Danny was born, and, and he lived his whole life 30 feet from where he was born. So I was born under that tree. He still lived there. He was a storyteller and a uh, traditional singer. He also had a master's degree in language preservation. And when he died, he was working on his PhD. So he really walked in these, these two worlds. And, and this is actually a blessing that he did at, at one of our farms. And Danny didn't consider himself a makai, uh, a medicine man but he was always asked to do blessings. And, and when Danny would bless you, he would use the eagle feathers, and you would, you would hear the wings of the eagle around you and over you and through you, and it would just, I mean, it would send shivers down your spine, and it was just this amazing thing. And actually, this day, Danny had us all in a circle, okay, about 100 people, he said, I'm not going to do a blessing today. You are. And eagle feathers are very powerful for the autumn. And some people have never even touched them or gone near them. And he said, you're going to bless each other. And he handed the feathers to the person in the circle. He said, bless the person next to you. And the feathers then got handed around. And in essence, that's what we're talking about, is, is how do we bless each other through knowledge and knowledge creation, through program and program creation, through the, the reestablishing of our relationships to each other so that the community and each person becomes a blessing upon the people around them. And five months later, Danny died. I don't think he knew then he was sick. But he knew it was time to begin to pass these things to everyone. And it was really an important, important reminder about how we pass on the work, how we pass on knowledge, how we share perspectives, where we stand, how we show people how to see, all of these things within, within community. Um, so that's a bit 
a bit of, of the work that, that we've been doing. I want to end with two real quick things that hopefully will be a little bit um, of a transition to, to Ian. Um, what's been happening in the Tonawatham community has been happening throughout Native communities in North America. Um, we're fortunate to have a lot of ability to share and exchange um, the Hopi and the Navajo in Arizona, the uh, Native uh, Tlingit communities in the Pacific Northwest, um, Alaska Native communities are also very much engaged with this process of, of reasserting and reclaiming and reliving food sovereignty in a way that the term's probably never even been used. It's not been conceptualized. It's more about life and life ways. Um, these are just some of the, the, the ways that that's, that's happened. And it's really been, I think, a, a, an increasingly local movement that is finding expression at kind of a national and international level, primarily through people talking to each other, people on the grassroots talking to each other. I'm going to end with just one minute, because I started with an elder talking. Um, and I want to share some perspectives from one of the young people who's come along with us in this journey over the last 20 years. Well, and his dad actually had like a bunch of fields. And those are traditional Akachin fields. What they would do is they'd catch the rainwater from the washes and that would go into their fields and they were all connected. This is my garden. My grandpa and his father were traditional farmers and they were the leaders for a lot of the ceremonies and there's ceremonies for like pollination, there's ceremonies for corn and for rain and for everything to do with food. Because I keep saying ceremonies because those are like the most important things to us because we're Native American and because we're autumn. Awesome. My goal, like my personal goal after high school and after college is to farm my grandpa's land. Our communities have to work together because Akchin or flood farming is something that takes the whole community. You can't do it with one family or one person. And that's why I really like Toka is that's what they're doing. Like they're bringing back food. So what they're really doing is they're bringing back culture. Everybody says that the youth are the leaders of tomorrow, but we're really the leaders of today. So as dry as this looks now, what's it gonna be like this summer? It's gonna be green. I hope so. <laughs> if the water comes, yeah, it'll be really green. Stop and, and turn it over to, to Ian to share a little bit about this common experience that we had, in which place-based peoples came together um, to share some of this work and some of this vision and, and some of these goals um, in Canada just last month, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna turn it over to, to Ian. I'm sorry, I'm gonna turn these back on. <laughs> so, Sometimes when I walk the streets of Glasgow, I see an old woman passing by, bowed down by shopping bags, and I ask myself, what force has made this woman what she is? What is her history? It's the holiness of the person that we've lost, the holiness of life itself, the inexplicable mystery and wonder of it, its strangeness, its tenderness, the holiness of life itself. It's from an essay by uh, a man called Ian Crichton Smith, Ahmadi, uh, a Gaelic poet and scholar uh, from the Hebrides. And um, it was called Real People in a Real Place, the, the essay. And I'd like to thank Tristan for introducing us to real people in a real place um, as part of our discussions and our conversations at CORE. And I'm grateful to him too for reminding me that when I'm working with issues of land and food and water and what we call natural resources, that I'm also working with the holiness of life itself. And what um, Pickett Burkus, who's a scholar who's worked for many years with native fishermen in the north of Canada, calls sacred ecology. And um, an old Gaelic bard said gach ach anson gluishin hai fuach ring le gul each place that we move in or we're moved by becomes part of us by love and um, I, I hope and believe that that's going to be part of the work of this um, international uh, resilience network the first meeting of which uh, Tristan and I attended in Canada last month um, on 
in British Columbia on the lands of the Sioux First Nation. Um, and the, the goals or the, the aims of the network um, are, I think one of the, the main aims is to provide a, a, a space for sharing just the kind of work that um, Tristan's been telling us about today, that this work is going on in the desert in Arizona, it's going on in, in British Columbia, it's going on in Aotearoa, New Zealand, it's going on in the Highlands of Scotland. It's happening in many, many uh, localities and there's a great deal of inspiration and learning to be taken from these different contexts. Um, another um, explicit aim, and it came out very strongly among the young people who were there, so I brought with me four young people from Scotland. There were um, a group of Maori and uh, some of their young people uh, and um, various First Nation people from, from North America was this, this importance of passing on traditional knowledge and I think we all felt that there were these missing generations, lost generations in each of our, our contexts, but that there's still living knowledge there and that the passing of that um, form of, of cultural reclamation is, a, is part of a, a reclamation of culture as a lived experience uh, and, a, and a reconnecting with place and um, those practices which give life in that, in that place. So that's going to be another important um, aspect of, of work. And also um, encouraging alliances beyond indigenous um, communities with settler communities and with other migrant communities and to learn from one another and to build bridges because I think in, in each of the different contexts there are divides there. Um, and so we met for three days um, and our learning was informed by the practices and the traditions of the Sioux um, people. And one of the things that, that interested me, Tristan and Sheila and I have been having some really great discussions over the last ten days or so, was that Tristan and I had quite different experiences at the summit, I think based on the work that we've been doing uh, and, uh, and, and, and yeah, our, our own practices. Um, I think we both agreed that the, the aspiration and the aims are something that's very much worth um, pursuing. And, but Tristan felt that the, the kind of scholarly input, there was, there was a kind of scholarly outcome or, or, or scholarly agenda and also it was important that it be culturally rooted. And um, I think it, it's fair to say that you felt that it, it was in the middle, it didn't quite achieve both of these. And Tristan's offered me some um, feedback and criticism and alternative ways that some of the key learning could have been done in different ways um, that I found very useful and which I'm going to report back to other um, members of the network as a way that we might build on our practice for the next um, events. For me, um, I've been, as a scholar, so on the scholarly side of things, I've been working with, um, within discourses of historiography and political theory. And so having a space where I could humanise my research, I could talk about why I feel driven or compelled to do this work as a human being and as a member of a people was um, something I, I found very valuable. I think it's, um, it's really important to have these spaces to talk about the, the, the deep why we're doing this work rather than just talking about the work itself. Mm -hmm. And as a member of, a, of a, a community and of a people, I could see the kinds of practices that we, were, that we were doing and trying to do there could have such resonance at home, um, both in terms of affirming a lot of the knowledge that the older people have that they've consciously forgotten, if I can put it that way. They've, they've internalised the, the sense that it's backward, it's not worth taking on. And yet, when I speak with them, I can feel it coming out, there's still something valuable there. So there are practices, there are ways of working that, that draw that out and can give them an affirmation. And equally, and this was certainly true with the four young people that were, that were along with me, there's a yearning among young people for that kind of connection, for that sense of, of place and sense of um, connection with a tradition and a lineage. Um, and, and so I found it a very, um, affirming and, and hopeful um, experience. And I, I think Tristan did too, and maybe um, making that contrast too strong. Um, and so um, we're, we'll, we're going to take that forward. I think one of the, th those are the themes that came out very strongly 
Um, I think the the Maori are hoping to hold to have the next hold the next iteration of that, or um, probably in Aotearoa, New Zealand next year. Um, but there certainly was a strong feeling among the Scottish contingent that we might um, get involved uh, too at some point in the future. And I think there's a there's a a, a, a willingness or an openness to to open up the network to lots of different um, um, locations because. But one thing, again, I, th I think the network um, is trying to deal with is the word indigenous, which has lots of different meanings for lots of dif for, for different people. In, in its political context, it grew out of um, some work done by the um, International Labour Organization in the 1950s, and it was very specific to particular populations, um, particularly those of indentured work uh, workers who'd been shifted about by the empire. And then in the 1960s and 70s, it was claimed as a term by um, groups who had been subject to colonisation but weren't part of the UN decolonisation process in the 1950s and 60s. So particularly the Maori and First Nations because the, the colo their colonial state had become an independent state and so those de decolonisation um, um, uh, declarations in the UN didn't apply there. And since then it's been kind of growing as other groups see the, the kind of political uh, value of that Within the network, there's an openness, or there's a willingness to think of it in a more open way, and to think about it as, as involving the, the traditions of, of place-based peoples, or people who are consciously trying to live in a, in a place-based way, which is why these alliances with non-indigenous, in that political sense of the word, um, communities are, are, are so um, important. So for me, uh, it, was a, it was a very valuable experience, and... and, and an inspirational one and one that I um, hope to stay involved with um, in the future and the, you know, there are plans bubbling away and I'll keep folk at core um, informed of, of, uh, of how things develop. Thank you. Thanks Tristan.